synchronicities. Yeah. I had this crazy synchronicity, and uh, I guess I'll briefly describe the synchronicity. It's pretty complicated, and I don't have it written down in front of me, but it doesn't matter. And yeah, then I'll just jump into a description of Bacon's Life and Times. I can try to find it quickly here. Um, I already hit the button, though, just so just so you know, so the, the go live button. So, oh, so, so you're live? live on YouTube. Oh, okay. You can still Thanks, be man. fine. Just be aware. All right. Darren again. Dude. Darren's I'm sneaking, just That's sneaking done. that kind of stuff in, just recording us without our knowledge. No, no, I told you. I'm legally required to tell you. <laughs> I think. <laughs> okay, I'm going to search for bacon synchro and see what comes up. To tell you. <laughs> and it'll just make me hungry. No results, huh? I had a salami sandwich. It was quite a while ago. It was at least two years ago. Oh, yeah, so. I know, but I keep them all in a folder, so... Da, 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 da. So have you? Uh, I guess we'll save that for the show. I'll save my questions for when we start. Yeah. Huh? Nothing bacon. Enough. That's weird. Nothing bacon on those folders. I mean, I can go back. You have a bacon folder. Would you? What would your name? Oh, oh, I think I got it from. No, that's recent. Maybe you put it in your super special synchronicity. Yeah, code. I know. I have a super special one. It's not there. Hmm. Okay, well, I guess I won't. I won't be able to read it like verbatim. Then I guess, or was it an atta- It wasn't an attachment that you sent, was it? No, it's just an email. Yeah, weird. Uh, check my email address, maybe. Yeah, I did. Uh, was it the O-9. same one? Was it the same uh, one that you usually use? Yeah, B O nine. I thought I had it here, but I don't. You can't find it, Graham? It's just an insane amount of material. Yeah. I mean, I yeah, right I don't in. Think, uh, yeah, let's, yeah, I don't let's think I can say it. All right, so Francis Bacon and the Gnostic oh. English Empire. Ha <laughs> ha. Were you and, pointing uh, at me for? Uh, I didn't hit record yet. I'm okay, hang on a second. <laughs> That's good. Ready, G? Let's do it. Robert Frederick, welcome to Grimerica. Thanks, buddy. Uh, thanks for having me. And you're responsible for this. Oh, boy. That's oh. good because I am I need to hear this because it really fits with what we've been talking about and what books I've been reading and stuff. It kind of, like you were saying in, in your podcast, it fits it all together in a way. So let's uh, let's start from the top. Yeah, we've been talking about this stuff for years in Grimerica, at least half the Half the existence of the show. Of what, Bacon and Shakespeare and all that? Yeah. I yeah. think Alan Green, the first time we had Alan Green on, I want to say, was like episode 207 or something like that. Well, I wonder if that's where I heard him. I don't yeah. think so, maybe. But he got me onto this Shakespeare authorship problem, was hearing him on a podcast. Yeah, we had him on a couple times. And I mean, and I read your synchronicity, which which seemed to kick this whole thing off that you sent me. And I can't find it for some reason right now, but it was a few years ago. 209. Episode 209 was uh, was Alan Green. Yeah. Time flies. You want to know the date? February 4th. Uh, it, was, it might have been you guys, but it really shocked me that. The only thing we had of William Shakespeare were were six signatures, and three of them were on his will. Not one letter from William Shakespeare to anyone, or one letter from anyone to William Shakespeare. And it really piqued my interest, because I had heard years ago that talking about the Earl of Oxford was supposed to be the real Shakespeare, and there was a documentary on TV about that, and I found that intriguing. But this, uh, when he when he said that, I decided to look into it, I guess. But it was the first time I had really heard of it. It shocked me. And I was already on the British Empire thing because the way I look at, uh, you know, I always wanted to know why the world was so messed up. And just everywhere there's trouble in the world, there's the English Empire. And certainly Canada has suffered greatly. You're still kind of under their thumb. And uh, I was kind of onto the English Empire, and I was sort of 
sniffing around bacon. He was his name was sort of coming up a little bit. Oh, uh, and one day I was listening to you guys a lot then, and you were asking for synchronicities. And I had this crazy synchronicity where I was listening to Michael Wan, who you've had on your show. And he was talking about the Susquehanna River and Jamestown. And I went to college on the Susquehanna River. And he mentioned that Francis Bacon was largely responsible for starting Jamestown down in Virginia. And I, that just stunned me. I thought, oh, my God, not more, not more on Francis Bacon. And I started emailing my friend who lives in Europe, who's kind of a history buff. He's not a conspiracy guy, but he's a history buff. And we went to college together, and we lived on the Susquehanna. And I sent him this email, and I just kept typing, you know, Francis Bacon, Susquehanna, Jamestown. And when I was done with the email, I turned and I picked up a book I had just taken off my shelf as I was coming up the stairs saying, well, I never read that book. Let me just look in, in that book. And so I finished this email, pick up the book, open it completely at random, look into the back of the book near the end at the bottom of a page, and I swear to God, my eyes fell on two words, and it was Francis Bacon. <laughs> and the name of the book is The Nature of Coincidence by uh, Arthur Kessler, who was kind of a history writer and it was into like psi phenomenon and stuff. He was a wide ranging writer, very famous in like last century, 50s and 60s. I think it's called On the Nature of Coincidence. So I was just floored. And, uh, you know, that started me looking into Francis Bacon. And as I started digging and digging and digging, it was like, you know, you see a little something in the ground and you start pulling the, the earth away and it just grows and grows and grows until you've got this, you know, underground chamber that looked like just a piece of old wood sticking out of the earth. And I, I've i become convinced that a lot of this is, is normie history that that Francis Bacon divides the ancient world from the new world, that, that the line between the old and the new runs right through Francis Bacon's life. And on this map that's on the screen, that's, that's London uh, uh, during Bacon's lifetime. And they call that period early modern, Tudor London, early modern, and it would be Tudor London and Tudor is the name of uh, Henry VIII and Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth. Their last name was Tudor. So when historians talk about this time period, it's called the Tudors, the Tudor London. It's a huge topic. They have tons of fans. You know, it was Henry VIII, Queen Elizabeth, Henry VII, Bloody Mary, burning people at the stake, the Reformation, war with Spain. It was, it was a really, really crazy time in history and a lot of colorful characters. Uh, the, you know, the most famous of which are Queen Elizabeth, uh, Francis Bacon, Walter Raleigh, Francis Drake, John Dee, uh, and a few others. But what I discovered was that Francis Bacon, his claim to fame is that he's a philosopher, and he started the scientific revolution. He was like a cheerleader for science. And the famous book about him is Francis Bacon from Magic to Science. And magic had infused all of Europe around this time, especially Christian Kabbalah and alchemy and um, Hermeticism, what, no? ast astrology was huge, even though Catholicism was still very, very powerful. Uh, but there were you know, cracks in the edifice and the uh, Protestant uh, Reformation had begun in Germany, but it really took hold in England as well. Sorry, what year would this yeah, be? Yeah, I was just going to ask that. When, when was the Tudors? mid 1500s so, oh, Right, sorry. Francis Bacon was born in 1561. The English Reformation began in like 1530. The Reformation in Germany began around 1520. So they were well into the Reformation, and after Henry VIII died, 
his daughter, Bloody Mary, took over, and she was a Catholic. So she switched the whole country over to Catholicism, and she's called Bloody Mary because she burned about 300 uh, Protestants at the stake. Wow. And is this when Anne Boleyn was in there, too? And there, there was a great um, TV series. I mean, I don't know how accurate it was, but... The Tudors? Is that what you're talking about? I remember, like... I never watched it, but I remember seeing commercials for it way back in it the day. It might have been, have been on been HBO yeah, or on, something it was on like one that. Of those, I think it was the History Channel, maybe even. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it, it, was it was a crazy, crazy time, and there's you know, tons of stuff about it, tons of videos, tons of shows. Anne Boleyn was Queen Elizabeth's mother. Queen Elizabeth is the daughter of Henry the Eighth. Henry oh, okay, VIII yeah, yeah, yeah. Cut off two or three of his wives' heads, one of which was Anne Boleyn, who was Queen Elizabeth's mother. She, lo Her mother lost her head when uh, Elizabeth was three. And that's how she grew up. And that's the kind of place it was. And, and is that Bacon's mom? I think Francis Bacon is the son. Or, sorry, I mean, like, that's the one that sort of interrupted you. That's it's kind of the, the reveal, the big reveal. But the scuttle, it does seem to me, that's what's really weird, because she never married. Sorry, I, I interrupted you there. You think Bacon's mom is who? Queen Elizabeth. Okay, you do think that, yeah. yeah. And the, the circumstantial evidence is overwhelming, and it changes everything. But I think the fact that he was her son is why he was so driven and why he was so intense about English nationalism and was so driven. He thought he would be king one day, I think. But it was a state secret. Nobody could know. But a, lots of weird things that happened in his life only make sense as if he was her son. But her official title was the Virgin Queen. She never married, apparently. And that was a huge source of conflict amongst uh, Londoners and the Tudors because there was no successor. Nobody knew who the next king would be, which was created a tremendous uncertainty. So it was a very, very uncertain time. And everyone was uptight so that everyone was spying on everyone else. It was still had a foot, that, that, that period of time still had a foot almost in the feudal era, where the lords and the earls and the dukes had a tremendous amount of power. England didn't have an army. It was quite easy to overthrow the king. All you needed was a small army and popular support. So there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty, plus the French and mostly the Spanish were trying to kill Elizabeth. The, the Pope actually excommunicated Queen Elizabeth as a woman and as a, as a Protestant, you know, on the throne of England. So it was a really crazy, uncertain, violent time. But what it created was uh, a, the best espionage network of all time to this day. The British intelligence is by far and away the best. And the reason for that are a couple of geniuses named William Cecil, who was the most powerful man in England at the time, who was Secretary of State and Treasurer, and this man, Francis Walsingham, who you may have heard of. He's extremely famous in the history of espionage. He not only uncovered plots, he created plots and then locked people up. And he's the one that finally... So there was another Mary, uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, who uh, he had her head chopped off in a very intricate plot that he designed where he caught her you know, trying to take over the throne from Queen Elizabeth. But... Espionage is a key part of the Bacon story. So Francis Bacon was born in 1561, right next door to the palace where Queen Elizabeth lived. If you look over to your left. The blue in the left there, yeah. The blue, that is yeah. uh, Whitehall Palace. And right next door to it is York Place, York House, where Francis Bacon was born, this enormous mansion. So have you ever heard my theory on that at all? Yeah. No. You have a theory? Yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. 
Let's it's a it. crazy wild theory. Oh, like it's God. complete fucking speculation. Let's like that people will not even they'll, so be like, they'll be laughing at. Every theory you have is complete speculation. <clears throat> so we had uh we had um Marguerite Riglioso on the show. Um and she writes about the Immaculate Conception and how how it's a secret sisterhood of of these women who would go through this this ceremony and this ritual together uh, to perform these immaculate conceptions. I mean, that's just really like that's high, super high level. Like it gets into quite a bit of details. But it's not just Jesus. There's been a whole bunch of other ones, like f- really famous. Like I think, I think Buddha, Jesus. Um, who's the other one? Uh, I don't know if it was if it was Hermes or if it was uh, what's his name. Uh, Thoth or not? Who's the who's the real man from Thoth? Uh, Herm- yeah, Trismegistus. I don't know. There was a there was a few very very prominent people, and and it really started to make sense to me in a way. Like they can create this divine spark through sound or light or whatever, and they they go through all this training, like this massive training to prepare themselves for this. And I thought right. Bacon is on that level. Like he's on. Like when when I listen to your podcast on him, and how absolutely smart. He is right off the bat. Like he is just like he's almost at that level of divinity where right. it wouldn't That's surprise me if the queen Elizabeth was in some fucking secret sisterhood and and she was the virgin. Like and this was another immaculate birth. Well, if anyone was, it would be her. I mean, they were deeply connected to all that stuff. But Bacon, in my opinion, is the most influential person who ever lived. And I would say he's the smartest person that ever lived, but you can't really prove that. But I think I can prove that he's the most influential person that ever lived. And he changed the world forever for a number of reasons. Um, Mainly because he, not mainly, but, but according to the outside normie world, it would be because he, he basically created modern science. And he started what's known as the Enlightenment. So this era was the Renaissance era with a foot in the medieval era. And the following era is called the Enlightenment. And he's considered the start of the Enlightenment solely because he he was a cheerleader for science and natural science. And he invented, literally invented a new way of thinking or he codified it. And it's called inductive reasoning as opposed to deductive reasoning, which is what the Greeks used. Deductive reason uses syllogisms, you know, all men are born of women. Socrates is a man, ergo and to wit, Socrates was born of a woman. And he, you know, Bacon could read Latin and Greek by the age he was seven. By the age of 12, he had like surpassed practically everyone in the country. He had practically read They say he read every book that was printed by the time he was 15. And he was traveling at 15, wasn't he? What was that? Wasn't he traveling internationally at 15? He he left left England at 15 under the aegis of Francis Walsingham, the spy. But he, uh, what was I going to say? He About the reading all the books? He was a Mozart. Mozart wrote his first symphony at the age of eight. Like Bacon was apparently writing plays and books at a very young age. He was just astonishingly brilliant. He had this crazy memory. His mother was an educator. His grandfather was an educator. He had all the best resources. The elite of London were very, very well educated. But he spoke Hebrew, Latin, Greek, Spanish, Italian, German, maybe some ancient languages. They had deep ties to the Middle East still, too. So there was just a lot of knowledge there, whereas most of the country couldn't read or write. Probably only 5% or 10% of the country could could read or write. And most of the people were really poor, and they were, you know, comparatively to most of the population of of England, they were like ultra-billionaires. What was the... What was the time frame when the when the fellow who got credit for being Shakespeare was alive? Was he alive the same time as Bacon? Yeah. Is there any chance they uh, knew each other somehow? Oh, definitely they knew each other. Like Bacon, Bacon and his people set him up as a front man. 
the actual Shakespeare, who we're supposed to say is Shaxper, because that's how his name was really spelled, uh, was in on it. He was he was the front man. I mean, did he have? He might have even gone after him because of his name. Because you you mentioned the the possibly the, yeah the the, the the deity kind of reference to Spear Shaker, right? It all fit really perfectly, or he made it fit perfectly. But Shakespeare is a reference to Bacon's muse, who was Athena, who carried a spear and she shook her spear at ignorance. So the name is actually a reference to Bacon's muse. <laughs> and Shakespeare <laughs> probably did not know how to read or write. There's no evidence that he could even read or write. There's no evidence he ever went to school. There's just no information about him besides a birth record, a marriage record, the birth of his two children, and that he arrived in London, you know, in the in the 1580s at the age of 20 something. There's just no record. And after that, there's absolutely no record that he wrote anything or that he even really. Well, he definitely, there's no record that he wrote anything. He was involved in the theater to some degree as an actor. And then he eventually invested in one of the theaters called the, uh, the globe. But there's a brilliant video out now by a woman named Diana Price uh, and a book. She wrote a book on the Shakespeare authorship problem, New Evidence. And she, as a, as a determined scholar, just examined every scrap of paper that was out there. And nobody, nobody knew Shakespeare as a writer. There's not one single reference to him as a person and as a writer. Like, ah, I spoke to William last night. He's really struggling with the Merchant of Venice. <laughs> he tossed some ideas around, you know, he's moving in a new direction, like nothing, absolutely nothing. And he was a, a poor guy from Stratford. And there's absolutely almost no references to poor people in all of Shakespeare. There's not one reference to the town of Stratford upon Avon. There's only royals and wealthy people and elites in the Shakespeare plays. In fact, there's a there's a distinct kind of disdain for commoners in the Shakespeare plays. They're almost like a side note. So it makes no sense. Mark Twain came out with a very funny book, which is another great video called Is Shakespeare Dead? Somebody turned his book into a one-person play. It's hysterical. The Shakespeare because Mark Twain was a commoner genius, but he wrote about life on the Mississippi. He wrote about his childhood, you know, running around as this poor barefoot kid, you know, having adventures. Whereas uh, Shakespeare from Stratford upon Avon never even mentioned his hometown. What did your so, uh, What did your friend think of all this? The, your your historical friend that you called from Europe, like, you know, he, he's not he's not chomping at the bit because he's not a conspiracy guy. He doesn't he doesn't really get it. It's too much. Like most people, once they accept Shakespeare was Shakespeare. You can't change your mind at the age of 50 or 60. It's too weird. It's like trying to, you know, it's about the like the moon landing or JFK. Yeah. Yeah. It's too it's just too weird and it is it is very shocking and weird because this has been, you know, for, it's been 400 years. <laughs> But even that aside, I mean, it, it's the whole like English Empire thing, which is which is fascinating because you know well, you hear about that. Really weird. At that point, I get weird. This is kind of basic stuff. Like yeah. literally, if you just watch Diana Price's video and you know Mark Twain's video, it's like, yeah, how could he possibly have written Shakespeare? It just it could not have happened. If you know anything about Shakespeare, you know how dense the characterizations are, and the fact that you needed to know all of English history and all of European history and Roman history. You had to know five languages and you had to have access to books that were only in Latin or Greek. You literally had to know how to read Latin and Greek to have written the Shakespeare plays. And this guy is only six scrawled signatures of him. There's no record he even owned a book. I mean, it just gets preposterous. And it should be pretty easy to people say, yeah, and the only argument they have is uh, they tell you, well, you don't think 
a commoner can be a genius. You don't believe in genius. But that's a bunch of bullshit because And he actually wrote about his childhood or someone like Bob Dylan, who came from, you know, the boonies and came to New York and changed, you know, changed uh, songwriting forever. The total commoner genius. I totally believe in commoner geniuses. Well, Mark and, Twain, too, like you just said. Yeah. Twain's the best example. Edgar and what Alan about Alan. Watts? Wasn't he, was he a commoner? Watts. Alan Watts. Is he even a real person? Oh. Yeah, he is, right? <laughs> Which, you know, which brings you to my next question. Is there, because you mentioned Mozart at eight and Beethoven's yeah. deaf and he's writing symphonies. I mean, are all yeah. these motherfuckers fake? No, 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 okay. no. Mozart was totally real. Bacon was totally real. It just, they didn't want Bacon to be known as a playwright, as a genius. That's why the podcast called The Hidden Life is Best. They kept Bacon hidden and Bacon even wanted to be hidden. He got that idea as a very young boy. He was going to work behind the scenes. He didn't really want to be famous. Whereas Mozart was paraded around by his father and said, look at what this boy can do. And he had him out performing at the age of five. Uh, but Bacon was an extraordinary genius and knew already as a young person, he mapped out this, this idea of staying behind the scenes. Plus, if he was his, if he was Elizabeth's son, he already was hidden. He already was in this strange netherworld where he couldn't, he couldn't really say who he really was. And England was under threat, and he really wanted to build an empire. There was something very early in him that he wanted to conquer the world. And but could, could that could that also be because England was under threat and it was so exactly. Exactly. It came out of this pressure cooker insecurity of London. Uh, and also, but it's, it's kind of part of what the Londoners lived on. I mean, they read all the Greeks. The Greeks are constantly talking about empire and tyranny. And the Romans, you know, were an empire for almost like seven, eight hundred years. And they read all those guys. They were very familiar with the history of Rome and all the famous Romans, Cicero and Horace and Marcus Aurelius, and he wrote plays about them. So this idea of empire was on his mind, and he was a big fan of this Italian writer named Machiavelli, <laughs> who's considered one of the greatest philosophers of all time, and he, he wrote about how to establish a strong kingdom in a book called The Prince. The Prince means the king. And he basically told uh, princes and kings to lie, like pretend to be good, pretend to be religious, you know, use murder, use terror. This is how you stay in power. Which it seems and, like that's really that's st it stayed that way for four hundred years now. I yeah, mean, it's still it's still happening. When was Machiavelli? When was that book written? Then was that way before Bacon? Was or? About fifty years before Bacon, right. he was the late fourteen hundreds in Florence, right when all this new occult information was coming in that sparked the Renaissance. Things like Hermeticism, uh, Hermes Trismegistus, Christian Kabbalah, uh, Magic, Cornelius Agrippa, Arsilio Ficino, and the Greeks, the Aristotle and the Plato came back in, and it, it sort of create this new movement called humanism where the power of the church you didn't just have to wait and suffer through life and hope you know you got chosen to go to heaven but this this idea this humanist idea was that you can change life on earth you can have an impact on earth you can be a person of action so the philosophy was changing and bacon absorbed all of that and that what kind of what led to his push for science but and so at 15 he went to france and he was involved in espionage at the age of 15 he invented ciphers so because of all the uncertainty there was all this code writing every all, all letters were written in code and they had to be deciphered you had to have the you had to be able the to key you had to have the cipher to break the code yeah 
at the age of 15, he invented some incredible ciphers that bear a strange resemblance to today's computer code, though he didn't have anything to do with that. But where it gets really weird, and the Shakespeare thing is only a part of it, uh, but he did, let's see, he came back and he became a lawyer. He went to law school at the age of 18. And he's considered one of the greatest lawyers of all time. Uh, in the field of common law, he actually kind of cleaned up the law books. He eventually became Attorney General of England. And he eventually became Lord Chancellor of England, which is the second most powerful position in the country. But this was only happened after his mother died. And nobody knows what Bacon was up to between the ages of like 20 and 44. He was a lawyer, but he didn't practice law. He sat on parliament in the commoners, but they worked like two weeks a year. He had a few side gigs, and for uh, Queen Elizabeth, he was learned counsel, but it wasn't even a paid position. It wasn't an official position. And it took someone until like the late, 20th century, like the 1900s, to say, what the hell was Francis Bacon doing between the ages of, of, say, 20 and 44? He didn't write any books. He wrote one book called The Essays. It doesn't seem to be, nobody knows what he was doing. And if you read a standard biography, they'll just gloss over that. They'll fill it in, like he was on Parliament, he was in law school, he got involved with his brother. What do you but think it was? Group, he was writing Shakespeare. Those are the exact years that Shakespeare was coming out. Wow. Exact years. And the first poems came out. And the very first poem that came out was called Venus and Adonis. And uh, it's a very violent poem. It's a very sexual poem. It doesn't really fit the tenor of the times, but they allowed it to be published. The censorship was very intense, very strong. Tudor London was a police state. England was a police state. You couldn't leave the country without permission. You had to be very careful what you published. You had to be very careful what you said. Everyone was always listening. Spies were everywhere. All the dukes and earls and lords all had their own spy networks. But the, the poem was allowed to be published. And immediately, some other poets wrote poems about the poem. And that's what they did in, in Tudor London. Was Poetry was huge like painting in, in uh, Florence, you know, 100 years earlier, or, sculpt, or sculpting, or philosophy in ancient Greece. They wrote poems. And two other poets wrote to Bacon, wrote, answered this Shakespeare poem called Venus and Adonis. And they immediately called it out as something, sounds like Francis Bacon wrote this. So immediately, right away, people were on to the ruse. But they got shut down. He couldn't talk about it. Because this is... This is where I get original, slightly original, is because I asked the question, if Bacon wrote Shakespeare, what does that mean? What are the implications of that? It's not just because, oh, aristocrats he wants to get creative. put their name on yeah. play. Yeah. It wasn't just but a creative outlet, obviously. It wasn't a creative outlet. It was a project of British intelligence. It was a method to control the population, and a method to do you know, what's called social engineering. It was a method to get ideas out into the public. And part of that is standard history now, because he wrote all these history plays, he wrote 10 history plays about the succession of kings in England, all in order to prop up the Tudor regime. They were written, they always made the Tudor regime look good and legitimate and strong. And it's so obvious that everyone knows that no Shakespeare knows the history plays were written as propaganda for the Tudor regime. And that would have been a good way to communicate to the masses, right? Because you don't have the internet, you don't have still doing like it today. A, a mail system. Well, but I mean, that puts Hollywood and all into perspective, right? I mean, it exactly. really makes me think of like, this has been going on for 400 years. like, exactly. And they blame the Jews, but it's actually the Brits. Exactly. The fucking UK posse, you motherfuckers. Exactly. There's, there were no Jews in England at the time. They had been kicked out in 1290. So Can it's we say Jews? We could say Jews, right? That's not like, that's okay. <laughs> I don't know what's okay anymore, man. I don't know. I know. I was going to ask you, Darren, what, what, what do I call your people? 
You can call me an Indian, but I wouldn't call anyone else that. <laughs> you, you can call native? me native. Uh, I prefer Indian. You like Indian? You can call me indigenous, or you could just call me Darren. I like Darren. that the best. Um, Darren. Uh, Chief, yeah, no, you hit Chief the nail Forks. on the head. Like, entertainment is a key part of any state, any empire. And it's absolutely true today. How many entertainers have come out against the lockdown? for the vaccine mandates, like almost none. So it's really important to control entertainment. And Francis Walsingham, the great spy master, he had his own theater troupe. Oh, there you go. Hmm. So they knew, and Bacon knew, Bacon knew all the old myths. Bacon knew the impact of stories on people. So that's really what Shakespeare was, and that's why nobody could chat about it back then, because it was a state secret. And if tongues wagged, tongues got cut out of their heads, or you got your ear cut off. That's why nobody could talk about Bacon being the secret son of Queen Elizabeth. It just you couldn't talk about it, and nobody could write it down. Most people couldn't write. Who's his dad? His dad was a guy named Robert Dudley, do we know Ooh. him, or is, there, is he smart cat? Is he a smart cat? Dudley he's, is not sounding good. He's a smart good. cat. He was super educated. He came from a wealthy family and got, was thrown in the Tower of London. This is how the story goes. Queen Elizabeth I and Robert Dudley were both in the Tower of London at the same time, put there by Bloody Mary because they were afraid of insurrection from them, because Dudley's father had tried an insurrection against Bloody Mary. And his father was put to death by Bloody Mary. So Jesus. they were in the tower at the same time, and they had known each other since they were kids, since there weren't a lot of aristocrats. I, I don't know how many. I need to talk to an expert from this time period, but I guess it was like 500 people controlled a million people in England. Most of them lived in London or had big houses in London. And these two aristocrats, Elizabeth and Dudley, were thrown in the tower, which is all the way to the right of the screen. That other blue line there is the city of London, and that's the wall of London, London Wall. And that's the Tower of London, which was the notorious prison where they, uh, they threw people in there sometimes for decades. And then just by the way, that's London Bridge. There was only one bridge over the River Thames, and that's it. Just uh, just to the north there, the northern the, most uh, blue to the line. left of the tower. You can sort of see the Tower of London. Yeah. So they supposedly even secretly got married in the tower, or they were secretly married later. Oh, I should have found that picture. There's a there's a painting of Elizabeth where she looks quite pregnant. And supposedly, dig this, as soon as, as soon as Elizabeth gets installed as queen, she's only 25 years old, she makes Robert Dudley her master of the horse, which was a title then. He had to take care of the horses. And just so happened he had, had to have an apartment right next to hers. <laughs> <laughs> I still think palace. it wasn't Dudley. It was immaculate, but we can but, go. Oh, my God. Jesus. Like, palace. And he... That, Apparently they they did get married. So the second coming married. of Christ already happened. Is that what your theory is? <laughs> and it was Francis Bacon, and he set us up for this fucking totalitarian nightmare. Thanks, Jesus. Thanks. Yeah. See, people try to paint Bacon as this, you know, force of wisdom and goodness for the world, and that's what almost all Bacon researchers think. But in fact, it is exactly the opposite. And what he sought to do. I'm cutting to the chase here. But what he sought to do was always preserve these conditions of an elite few lording it over, you know, the suffering masses. That's exactly what he wanted to do. But he knew conditions were changing, and so he would was going to need science to do that. But, yeah, so I do think he was the son of Elizabeth, and there is a father. And he, he wanted to be prince consort, which is what you call the king. That's what Prince Philip was to Queen Elizabeth II. And there are letters, there's diplomatic letters that talk about the fact that they have a child. There's, there's a lot of evidence that they had a child together. And some Bacon researchers think they had two, child, two children together. So who were the co-conspirators then on, like... You mentioned the the British Secret Service. So is this all just right. like an MI6 operation that's yeah. that's doing yeah. all this? 
Yeah, all these people like this William Cecil, the guy I showed you here, he knew, uh, Walsingham knew. I think quite a few people knew, uh, especially about the Shakespeare. I mean, they had to they had to have known actors and other playwrights and any of the other aristocrats because they all were writers. They all were in on the scene and they all had to be in on it. And they all just kept their mouth shut and they killed the paper trail. But yeah, this was uh, this was a state sponsored operation from the very, very top. Everyone knew probably on a need to know basis, but it had it couldn't have just been bacon and, you know, a couple people. It was too big and it went on for too long. And then later, this huge book came out, the first folio. But here's where it gets really weird. Is that Bacon is heavily and obviously, and now it's common knowledge, started the Rosicrucian movement. Which was a semi-hoax, but it, it galvanized all of Europe, France, Germany, parts of England, where they, they came out with this pamphlet. Now we're in like 1616. Uh, Bacon has power. Oh, by the way, he never got any power under his mother, Queen Elizabeth. Only when she died, and this next king was King James I, King James I knighted him right away. He wasn't even a knight. He was still Mr. Francis Bacon. His mother wouldn't even knight him. She wouldn't give him any power because she knew if he had any power in the in the court, he They'd could maybe him. finagle a little side group. So it was very weird to go back to that point that nothing happened for Bacon until his mother died. <laughs> well, back then, that sort of shit put a target on your head right away too, right? Yeah. That's why she didn't want a successor because all they had to do was kill her and there would be someone to take to take over. Yeah, and then when he's a kid, then you just sort of cram him in the back corner and make all the decisions. Exactly. And then you kill him when he starts getting too old and asking questions. That's how it worked. And they were so brilliant that Elizabeth survived for 45 years. She died an old lady still on the throne. And apparently it was almost her dying breath where she said, let it be James. Let James be king. You know, she wouldn't say. She wouldn't even talk. It was illegal to talk about succession, like who was going to come next. It was a very eccentric part of Tudor London. Couldn't discuss who's coming after Elizabeth. It was forbidden. Uh, so James gets in. And uh, a few years later, this Rosicrucian craze takes over. And that was... Uh, philosophy, these these writings, the Fama Fraternitatis, the Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, uh, the Fama something. And it said that we are a secret brotherhood. We are the invisible college. We have special knowledge. The world is changing. And this is what we know, and this is what we do, and we do healing, and we have we have we have knowledge, we have knowledge, and it drove everyone crazy. Everyone was completely galvanized by this message, and it had a Christian veneer, a Christian Rosenkreutz. And they would still talk about you know Jesus, our Lord and Savior, but it was really prophetic because the world really did start to change right there. And the writings of the Rosicrucians, there were only three things published, and nobody ever even admitted to being one. It was a secret brotherhood, and it all sort of died out when Bacon died later. There are Rosicrucians now, but they don't really have any connection to that period of Rosicrucianism. But it was very kind of mystical, but it was actually also a lot about science. It's so obviously Baconian. And what's really weird is that that's a precursor to Freemasonry. And what Bacon here, and I'm, I go a, a little bit out on a limb here, but I'm far from alone, is that it appears that Francis Bacon started modern Freemasonry. And under under the guise of Rosicrucianism at first, or 
Uh, the Rosicrucianism sort of softened people up for this idea that there's a hidden brotherhood that's working for the benefit of all humanity, right? That's what every cult is doing, is benefiting all humanity, and that helps pull people in. And But most people think that Freemasonry wasn't started until the early 1700s, I guess, right? Freemasonry didn't become official. They announced themselves to the world uh, on St. John's Day, 1717. Sometimes you hear the date, 1723. But they were already a fully formed group. It was four lodges came out in England, and they said, we are now the United Grand Lodge of England. We are the Freemasons. And to this day, nobody can really say who started the Freemasons. Because what's another now accepted, I consider it a fact, a cold hard fact, is that the Freemasons developed out of the Knights Templars. And I know that sounds crazy, and I know it sounds like a fantasy novel, but it's always been the rumor, and the connections are just too absolute and too strong. And uh, if anyone is interested, this is a great book called Born in Blood by an independent historian who's not a conspiracy guy. He's not anti-Freemason even. But it tells this great story of uh, the Peasants' Rebellion in the 14th century. And he ties Freemasonry to the Knights Templar unequivocally. Like, the rumors are over. It's true. The Knights Templars became the Freemasons. And in my opinion, that's the biggest story of the entire last millennium. The, the Knights Templars were so freaking powerful and so rich and had their hands in basically everything. They're implicated in starting banking, uh, shipping, you know, warfare. And, and when yeah, when would that have been then? When did that transition happen? That would have happen? been the 1300s. They, they started in the 1100s to protect pilgrims on, uh, on the Crusades. So all the Christians ran down to take over Jerusalem from the Muslim heathens, and they needed protection. And so the Templars were formed, the poor knights of the Temple of Jerusalem. And they protected, that's not their exact name, it slipped my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, yeah. they would provide protection for the pilgrims going down to Jerusalem. The First Crusade actually did take over Jerusalem, and the Christians controlled Jerusalem for like 150 years, I think. And they established themselves in Jerusalem and in Europe, and they actually started banking, because if somebody wanted to travel to Jerusalem, they could deposit their money in Europe with the Templars and take a check. And when they got to Jerusalem, they could cash the check and get their cash for a small fee. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then they had, and then they, when they got forced underground, that that's when it became okay. Freemasonry, or not quite. So yeah, so they. 1307, the French king and the Pope move on the Mason, uh, move on the Templars, because they had got involved in some really dark, ugly, heretical stuff. They also were too rich and powerful. They wanted their money and their land, but they do. It does seem this is where the Gnostic element comes in that they converted to a strange form of Christianity called Gnosticism, specifically Manichaean Gnosticism which believes that this world was not was formed by the creator god but that creator god is a sub god and a demiurge and is evil and he created this world to trap our souls and our job as gnostics is to gain gnosis or knowledge collect sparks of light so that when we die we can navigate this complicated metaphysical hierarchy and escape the prison planet that the evil demiurge has created. It's really, really nutty. And it leads to it leads to scientism and it leads to what Bacon got heavily involved in, which is wanting to take over the world and do battle with God because God is evil. They sincerely believe that. And it was a big movement. Gnosticism was a big movement. I believe it came out of trauma. Just like there's always kind of a 
a push for something happening, like the espionage in England got so strong because of the uncertainty. Well, this Gnostic belief that God was evil probably came out of a lot of trauma. Certainly the Roman Empire was going around, you know, killing thousands of people all the time. But it's a response to why, also, why is there evil in the world? How could there be a just God who allows such evil in the world? Which is still a, a philosophical question people are still debating. Now, I've come to my own conclusions about that. But you want, can that's you where the Gnosticism came in. Can you get into your own conclusions about that? My conclusions are that... Um, that the evil is a result of free will. That actually God loves us so much, he gave us total freedom. And we are able to do whatever we want in this plane of existence, which is just one of many planes of existence. And it's a place where we go to develop our souls. And if we didn't have evil to contend with, how could we develop our souls? We would just be like the angels. That's what makes us different than the angels, is that we have to struggle here. We have a challenge. Our challenge is to be happy without being nasty and evil. And I think because there's a pull to being powerful. You know, there's a there's a charge. You know, you get a charge from it. And how can we still be happy and, and be a good person? We're here to to understand good and evil and develop our souls in in a moral way like struggle with morality and if there was no evil there would be no struggle and that's how i've worked it out it's a, it's a consequence of free will that's interesting and that life is a gift life is beautiful life is intensely complex and and kind of perfect you just look at your body science tells me that life is incredibly beautiful and must have a creator you've got two trillion cells in your body in each one of those cells, they think 2 trillion. It might be 1.5. It might be 3. They're not even sure. Each one of those cells has hundreds of thousands of molecules. Each one of those cells is a complex, choreographed work of you know symphonic beauty carrying out specific tasks connected to all the other cells in your body almost instantaneously. Like if you see something, your adrenal gland immediately pumps out adrenaline and it's like a split second. You just saw it with your eyes. But your adrenal gland responds. And supposedly hormones leave your brain to turn on your adrenal gland. But it's a trillions of cells in this complicated symphony just to allow you to walk through this beautiful planet with each each creature, one tree, you know, is almost infinitely complicated. To allow you to find love and purpose and meaning and build a house, you know, run away from lions, uh, fall in love, raise your children, do whatever you want to do. But it's this incredible, beautiful world that good far outweighs the evil. And just just the fecundity and the health of the planet. Just, I but, really, truly really believe that joy is the ground of being, and I'm an herbalist, and I, the plants taught me that. Like, just look at how plants are. You know, they're just ecstatic. But has <laughs> this research changed your view at all, though? Because, I, I mean, I've been reading these books now from the 1800s and the 1700s. There's this one we're reading called Proofs of Conspiracy, um, and it's yeah. about it's about the Illuminati and the, the, yeah. the German Union and... And uh, and it, what you're talking about here really puts that book into perspective because they were they were spying like the Illuminati would bring people in they'd say you got to watch your neighborhood watch your people and we yeah. want to know like it was creating this spy network basically and and for them to figure out what the per, the personalities of these initiates were like and they would talk That's about exactly it being what we're talking about and that they would is and they would talk about being like for the liberty. And equality of people. That was their whole, that was the whole, like the first few levels of initiation and their, whatever would become public would be about that. Right. Although they'd have to take, take over or, or at least uh, infiltrate the church and the state to, to, in order for that to happen. But that was that, their, you know, that was their draw. That's what pulls people in. Yeah. I mean, the church was too, again, this is what pushed that. The church was too severe. And the yeah, church was yeah. burning people, and the church yeah. was censoring people. 
And but, there needed to be a loosening. But this but was like in the seven, in the 1700s, yeah. though, in France, they say, yeah. they say there was like 266 lodges of Freemasonry. I mean, to me, it seems like Freemasonry became the infrastructure for all these other little organizations. 100% correct. Um, I'm glad you're reading that book. I've always wanted to read it. I have been reading about it recently. It'll he, be out in audio soon for you. So. Awesome. He was approached by the Illuminati to spread the Illuminati in England, and he pretended to go along with it, and he saw what they were up to, and he tried to expose it. That's and, interesting. Uh, so that was before yeah. that was before Weishaupt's time then, like a couple hundred years or 150 years before. No, it was right around the same time. Weishaupt was 1770s, and this guy was 1770s. He was a contemporary of George Washington. So the, oh, the, I the thought you were talking about Freeman. Bacon. Okay. Yeah. But the Bacon Freemason, did it start good? Because, of course, it has good. It says it's good, of course. Well, we know lots of great guys. That, I mean, a lot of our guests yeah. have been Freemasons, and they're fantastic yeah. people. I mean, they're very, yeah. you know. It doesn't have to wreck you. It doesn't have to make you a bad person. It's a feeder system. Yeah. You attract people, and you see who's really set to go up to the higher levels and or, or to other organizations like the German union or the, or the, or the, exactly. Uh, you Illuminati or whatever. Yeah. 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 To where the real craziness begins. Um, for sure. So but, has that changed your opinion? I mean, I know you've got this sort of rosy look on humanity and life and this divinity no, that we I are. I, I have a rosy look on life. I think, I think life is exquisitely beautiful. But it's humans and our free will and our, you know, you could call it Satan. You could call it Lucifer, like tempts us to seize power and control. And these guys do that because they feel justified. It's a religious crusade because they really do believe that that there's a demiurge who's evil. And it's almost their responsibility to wage war. And they're, they're actually trying to steal the planet from the demi-urge. And it's happening right now. I mean, this is, they're, they're justified in their, in, their, exactly. in their totalitarian efforts. They feel justified. That's why Greater I'm good, on bro. This. this is exactly the Great Reset. Like Francis Bacon is a direct precursor to the Great Reset. Like, and Because it, it's all about science, right? They've replaced religion with science. Illuminati were completely successful. What does the government say now? We were founded under trust god and god we trust what is it now trust the science yeah and you can't even debate the science like in the old days you couldn't debate the religion right it had to be about jesus you could sort of fudge the the boundaries and you could say anything you wanted about science you could believe whatever you wanted about how mice came into being or how the world started or anything but now you can't debate the science i know anymore. it really feels like we haven't even moved forward in a lot of ways i mean Twitter. It's... No, they just replaced religion with science. So, because it's easier to lie with science, so they can take control. They just wanted to take control. They didn't care about humanity. Well, science, you can change the narrative too, right? You can't really do that. Yeah. With, you can only take so many hard right turns or left turns with religion. <laughs> with point. science, you can just be like, "Oh shit, we were wrong. You motherfuckers can't leave your house." Sorry. Yeah, it changed. Fuck. Yeah, we have new data. Exactly. The data was out. You guys are a threat to yourselves. Yeah, there's no book of science. Like you still got to kind of follow the Bible if you're religious. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So he what? Wrote. But you bring this a lot back to like the British Empire and 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 how does how does the sort of the occult magic part fit into this uh, this initiative of of like taking over the world via via the British Empire? I mean, because then we get into where does John D and all that fit in fit in with this? Where you kind of right, get some real like. That's a great question. So D was very influential on the whole Rosicrucian idea. And the occult, what I think happened. So he was at the same time as this? Absolutely same time. D was just before Bacon. D was hugely influential in that whole occult milieu. And they shoved all the occult stuff into Freemasonry. Freemasons, Freemasonry is really a religion. They say it's not a religion. But it believes in God. It has ceremonies. It has rituals. It has funerals. 
In fact, you can't be a Freemason if you don't believe in God. Well, they say great architect now, right? Is is that just their just alcoholics? Says power. Is that just Alcoholics Anonymous way of saying God as your own understanding? Well, it just I says mean, higher, higher power now. Higher power, it just says yeah. you have to believe in a higher yeah. power. That's the first question they ask you. I just you went believe, through it all. Uh, like you believe recently. in a higher power, yeah. yeah. I was just initiated into the Masons like uh, two years ago. No kidding. Yeah, and then I left because I didn't agree <laughs> with their fucking COVID protocols. I, it's funny, Robert. I thought you heard that because you mentioned uh, in your podcast about how you can actually leave the order now. No, I didn't and I know thought, that. I wondered if he. They sent me a letter. Yeah, I have a fancy letter of uh, whatever. But they said I could come back anytime. But they did send me like a fancy calligraphy letter that was my official. Uh, leaving? Uh, I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, fancy word for leaving. Yeah. Good for you, Darren. Mark Twain was a Freemason. He left. I have a good friend who left. Um, yeah, well, that's that's one of the reasons why Freemasonry is so strong is that you can leave. Yeah, Most and I still have a huge can. amount of respect for a bunch of Masons that I know, yeah. but it's just yeah, like, you know what, if you guys aren't going to stand up to tyranny, then I can't be a part of this shit. Good for you, man. Good for you. No, I know a lot of Masons, so I know some Masons. Um, but that's one reason it's so brilliant is that you can leave. Most cults, you can't leave. You, you get shunned. You get harassed, like Scientology or Jehovah's Witness or a, a small cult. They'll just harass you and harass you and harass you. The Masons, you can walk away from. And that's one reason it's so successful and so brilliantly organized. You know, it's semi-independent. There's no actual central charismatic leader, which is the definition of a cult. You're supposed to have a charismatic uh, leader, central figure in an inner circle that everyone tries to get into the inner circle. So Freemasonry is is outside that strict definition of what a cult is. But on the other hand, it takes over some people's lives. And if you ever go to a cemetery and you see all those obelisks, I don't know if they have that up in Canada, but the East Coast of uh, America here is, was heavily Freemasonic. There's a lodge in every single town, and there's hundreds of small towns in New York. And any town over 500 people, I think, has a lodge. I mean, you know, spitballing here, but they're everywhere. And you go to the cemeteries, and there's obelisks everywhere. Guys just love Freemasonry. And I get it. You know, it is a brotherhood. You do join this club. You do feel connected. And it's great for business. I don't know if they told you that, Darren, but, you know, if you need some printing done, you know, hire a brother to do it. Keep, keep the money in the family. And you join a brotherhood. And Freemasonry, it was Freemasons that wrote the Constitution. And that Constitution is keeping us protected from a lot of this tyranny that that Austria is suffering under, Australia, Canada. Also, the Indians, though, the Iroquois Indians, developed this whole idea of republic within a republic. So the states' rights here, like DeSantis down in Florida, can tell Biden to fuck off. Yeah, it really That's felt like that came from all the learning of the the late 1700s and the, the mess-ups with all those organizations through Europe and but it was the and England. Native Americans, specifically the Iroquois Indians, that developed that system where you have separate governments under one bigger constitution. Each state has a constitution, and you're under one bigger constitution. That was how the Iroquois Indians uh, organized themselves right here in upstate New York, and they they were amazing, amazing, amazing. I think they had the most highly developed democracy of all time, if you look into it. It was a consensus democracy. Women could participate. You know, grandmothers could uh, impeach the leader. God forbid you if you got impeached. You couldn't be sachem if you wanted to be. You know, it was, they knew. They knew about tyranny. They knew they had to protect against tyranny, just like the founders here did. And they wrote that very complicated constitution to try to protect against tyranny. And so far, America's ahead of, you know, the Europeans because they can't give us a blanket vaccine mandate here. They can't give us blanket lockdown orders here like they can in Austria and Australia. And that comes from the Iroquois, but it also comes from the Freemasons. And that's what makes this complicated, is that there, there is a lot of good in Freemasonry. And there was a lot of bad in the church. Yeah, but exactly. They, yeah. Like all cults use this idea of we're going we're gonna to get something spectacular if you join us. And we're going to be good for all humanity. We're going to change the world. This is what our cult's missing. We need to... 
Yeah. Maybe that better I was it. thinking about you guys. I mean, you guys could start a cult so easy. But we, we uh, get accused of having a cult. <laughs> 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 but yeah, you just got to say the right things and get people convinced and give them a sense of belonging. But here's a funny thing is I told you the, uh, the period just after the Renaissance is called the Enlightenment. Freemasons, you know this, Darren, tell you you will become enlightened by Freemasonry. And Masons call themselves sons of light and followers of light, which ties back into the Gnosticism where you're supposed to gather sparks of light. And light is kind of like the, the key word, the signal, the signal word for Gnosticism. And it's rife in Bacon, Bacon's writings. He's always talking about the light, the light. And he even makes kind of makes mistakes. And in fact, uh, the New Atlantis, his most famous book is called The New Atlantis, and it's about a utopia that a sailors, some sailors stumble on. They're lost at sea, and they, they come upon this utopia. And the utopia is very much based on science. And uh, at the very end of the book, they're talking about knowledge and science and good for all of humanity, and the head of... The new Atlantis, it's not called Atlantis, it's called Bensalem, says actually what we're looking for is light. And that's how the book ends. And he just tips his hand right there, like we're Gnostics and we're looking for light. And it's just rife. When you start to read Bacon with this idea that he was a Gnostic, all this stuff just tumbles out. And he's making references to it. And when you read Shakespeare, with the idea that he was a Freemason, there's just massive amounts of Freemasonry. Like Macbeth? And now if we cut to Macbeth, uh, there's a new new version of Macbeth coming out on Christmas Day by Joel Cohn with the Cohn brothers, with oh, Denzel boy. Washington, Francis McDormand. So this is good timing. <laughs> It'll be woke Macbeth, I'm sure. It's going to be some woke, but you can't change Shakespeare. You can change the locale and the milieu and the costumes. Oh, they'll change it. They can change can anything they them. want. They can change anything they want. They can. They they, they will just use the name Shakespeare and create their whole new modern. Uh, they just changed Graham's show, so he's he's super he's super <laughs> aggro. Oh yeah, there's a right fantasy <laughs> fantasy series called The Wheel of Time, and they're completely destroying it. Right, but you can't do that you, <laughs> you can't you can change some words to modernize them, but they'll lose all credibility. Oh, uh, they they'll care about credibility. They'll do it. No, dude, dude, this is Shakespeare. You I, can't actually add to Shakespeare. Okay, let's talk. I want to be in contact with time. you after this comes out. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna talk wanna, yeah, wanna talk. I tell you it's gonna be word for word <laughs> like the original play. If okay. not I stand corrected. I'd be shocked. Oh, that, that this is fascinating. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Lunch. We want but they're lunch. changing the race, and they're also making. Yeah, that's uh, fine. I mean, I don't care about that. It's it's the, it's yeah, the, yeah. it's changing no, the content you, of the you know. I, to I totally hear yeah. you. Like, see, I don't know if work. Denzel will go woke. You think? He did. He's. They're all part of the system. Even yeah, they're Denzel? gonna. Yeah, they're gonna. They're gonna use it yeah. for their own Even ideology. Denzel? I'm telling you. We'll see. It'll be, this will be the greatest test because you're right. They should never even touch Shakespeare. I mean, Robert Jordan's fantasy novel is one thing. His 14 massive books is one thing. Didn't he not great. even finish it? He just like walked well, he out died. on it? Oh, he died. He died. I mean, this Same is thing. a desecration on, <laughs> on his life. Who wrote the last book then? Uh, Brandon Sanderson wrote the last three. It was one big book turned into three. Was he qualified for it? Yes. He did a great job. Did they know each other? No. But Shakespeare will be the ultimate test because, like Robert says, like there's no way you should be changing any of that. But we'll see. We will see. Speaking yeah. of uh, seeing, where can people see more of Robert's stuff? Do you have a YouTube channel? You know, I know you have the podcast and all that. Where can people uh, find all that? But hiddenlifeisbest.com. Let's just uh, can you summarize that Macbeth uh, thing quickly for so us before we let you go? Thing. And this has really shocked me and really gave me the creeps, man. Like I couldn't, I couldn't work on this for a couple of weeks. Really? <laughs> yeah, it really gave me the creeps. Uh, I've hated Shakespeare's like since a kid, since I was a kid. So I yeah, don't, I don't even really popular. know it. Yeah, yeah, it's not real popular. You're supposed to like it. You're supposed to know it. Um, 
I don't know why my screen's not opening some of these pictures. No, I can There's see Queen you. Elizabeth with the eyes, the all-seeing eye, and the Agatha Damon Gnostic snake. Uh, so, the, you know, the Queen knew about this, and I think this Masonic Gnostic imagery was already pretty deep into the Tudors and into England and London. It just got shut down by the, uh, by the church and by the people. You know, the people were just really strongly Christian and didn't trust anything. There's the uh, Gnostic snake. They worship the snake. Um, let me see. Uh, I didn't give you guys a picture of bacon yet. No, you're. Yeah, you're not. You're still on the you're map. Not giving too. us any pictures. Yeah. Yet. Oh my God, my yeah. my screen filled with pictures. Yeah, you gotta. Uh, I don't know. Maybe stop sharing and try sharing again. Or I'm not sure why it's. Oh, not. We're running out of time, right? Oh, there's well, it's not that. really. Oh well, technology. Um, so, so Macbeth is a story of a man who is coming home from war. He's an incredible warrior. He basically wins the battle for Scotland single-handedly when he and his friend Banquo come across three witches who tell him he's going to be named Thane of Cawdor, which is sort of like being called the Duke or the Earl of Cawdor. He's going to get a new royal position of gentry and that he will one day be king. And then they tell his friend Banquo that, Banquo, you're not going to be king, but your kids are going to be king. And they're completely stunned by it. And as I read it again today, parts of it, like Macbeth seems to go into a trance when they say that to him. He's like, and Banquo's like, what's the matter, man? Where are you? Where'd you go off to? And immediately, Macbeth gets the idea because... Five minutes later, someone runs up to Macbeth and calls him Thane of Cawdor, like the witch's prophecy comes true. And Macbeth turns to the witches and says to them, from whence did you get this strange intelligence? So he calls them intelligence, and that was the name for a spy in those days, intelligencers. And they're like spooks. Spooks is another word for spies because they can kind of come and go and vanish. So what happens is Macbeth gets this suggestion, I'm implying it's a hypnotic suggestion, to kill the king. I'm going to cut this real short. And he goes back to his castle, and his wife somehow also just agrees with him. We're going to have to kill the king. And that's the central part of the play, where Macbeth doesn't want to kill the king. He changes his mind, and his wife pushes him to do it. And Macbeth starts having these visions of a knife and the knife pulls him toward the king and they murder the king. And again, I'm going to cut this real short. It foments a civil war. There's this disaster in Scotland and there's a horrible civil war and Macbeth becomes a serial murderer and he kills a bunch of people or has his people kill a bunch of people. It's really grisly. It's really like on stage, bloody violence. A, a little boy is killed on stage. It doesn't happen off stage. Jesus. And, you know, the Polanski version is is modern and fun. Not fun, but very watchable. Roman Polanski made a version in 1971, just after his wife was killed by the Manson family. And he's kind of creepy. He's an occultist. I think there's some connection there. And then the play, eventually, I won't, you know, you can still watch it. Macbeth goes back to see the witches again. He's now murdered Banquo and tried to murder Banquo's son because the witch, he now believes everything the witches say. Uh, they said Banquo's son was going to be king. So he tries to kill Banquo and kill his son. And uh, he goes back to see the witches and they give him this prophecy that no no man of woman born can kill Macbeth. That's one of the things they say. And they also show him three visions. And also, Darren, you'll have to go listen to episode four of my podcast. Start at the 55-minute mark if you don't want to hear my talk about scientism. And I do a review of Francis Bacon's life. But the 55-minute mark, I jump into a detailed exploration of Macbeth. And you'll have to get into that because I detail all the Freemasonic imagery in Macbeth that comes from Freemasons. Freemasons have analyzed the play. And Freemasons have analyzed all of Shakespeare. 
And dude, it's just mind blowing how much Freemasonry is in Shakespeare. And this is 120 years before it was officially a thing, 140 years. It's just crazy. Once your eyes are open, it's like, what? So Macbeth is kind of all alone in his castle. And uh, this other main character, Macduff, had fled to England and roused uh, the Duke of Northumberland to send an army, which is called the English Army in the play. And uh, Macduff and the army and the former king's son march on Macbeth's castle. And um, eventually slay him. Macduff first runs in the Duke of Northumberland's son. Macbeth kills him. Why they let the little boy come in, I think, is a form of sacrifice. Macduff comes in and finally kills Macbeth with the English army behind him. So what happens is that the true hero of the play is the English army. Everyone else in the play screwed up royally. Huh. It, it, it's not really a tale of good against evil because Macduff kills Macbeth, but Macduff had abandoned his family and to get killed. And the true evil, the witches, is never confronted. They never actually confront the evil. The evil is not overcome. The evil just created this horrible chaos which the english army the empire has to get rid of yeah. order order yeah. it's like we have to invite the english army in we can't handle macbeth and nobody ever mentions the witches and the only people that saw the witches were macbeth and banquo both dead and the other person that heard about the witches was lady macbeth she's dead and at the end of the day the english army is the hero and nobody ever notices that but that's the actual story. And wow. that fucking creeped me out. Yeah, because what great. it is, is Macbeth is actually a Lee Harvey Oswald. He's a Sirhan Sirhan. He got mind controlled to foment, to create an assassination that started a civil war. And how many times has, has England done that in the ensuing 400 years? I mean, that's how World War I started. Yep. The assassination of Archduke Ferdinand. Yeah. And World yeah. War One was, I, th I think, I mean, I want to do something on that a little bit more because I think that was, a, we were talking recently about that being a real pivotal point in erasing, that was a, it, dude. erasing a lot. of. Actually, you might have touched on it in one of your podcasts. I uh, did. They wiped out the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and the Russian Empire in one fell swoop. Yeah. Read you, they, read you a lot of the lines. Yeah. yeah. And, and not they, only the Middle East, probably Europe too, I think, right? They redrew the map of the Balkans and they screwed up the Germans and if you read Guido Preparata's Conjuring Hitler, you'll see that they knew that the Germans were going to go hard right wow. and totalitarian, and they wanted to pit them against the Russians because the English were afraid of the Germans and the Russians because they were just as powerful as the English. They were just as smart as the English, and they had more land, and they had to destroy, Eng they had to destroy Germany and Russia for England to remain powerful. And that's the shit that Bacon and these guys would think about. They became these masters of geopolitics. And we didn't really get into the occult, but it shows the occult because I believe that mainly the occult is used for mind control. And there's no accident that the word cult comes from occult. And they suck you in and they the, promise you visions. Yeah, the inversion and greater, parts and, yeah. Greater knowledge. And then the inversion, they tell you that, you know, you're here to change the world and, Anyway, what, how are, we're way over time, huh? Yeah, it's six thirty. Um, yeah, it's just fascinating that's that the shit, man. Part, they're, yeah. they're 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 taking over the planet in a war against God, and they'll do anything to do it. And right now, they're you know they're vaccinating little kids with the poison with poison to weaken us all. They don't give a fuck. They just want. But this is what people need to know of some of this history, right? Is some of the, the this has been going on for hundreds of years. I mean, they're talking about hundreds of years. And Shakespeare was a project of British intelligence. And I think I can continue to make that clear. And I think Macbeth makes that clear. So are you going to keep going on your pod? Are you going to keep putting pushing out episodes, or like, are you thinking yeah. about a book or something maybe in yeah. the future? Or because I, I need to, I need to do a book about this possibly to bring in some income. Uh, but I'm going to keep popping out episodes, and I'm probably going to, instead of these very difficult scripted shows, do some interviews with people. 
Yeah, um, man. Let's come. Let's do this again when you uh, like in a few months, maybe six months, four or six months or something like that. And I'd love uh, to. thank you. I'd yeah, love and to. and then we can get a little update. We can get into the occult side of things a little bit, see where things. Yeah, are we'll at. do more with the occult because I got a lot to say about that. But you can see how giant a topic it is from the history of oh, England, to yeah. British Empire to the history of science to Freemasonry. Freemasonry alone is like just crazy yeah. enormous. Yeah. And by then, I'll probably be uh, be ready for uh, my close up. Prime time. <laughs> mug shot. Right on, yeah. Right, right, on. <laughs> right on, Robert. Where can you give us those links again where everyone can track you down? So it's the hidden life is best.com. And everything's there, lots of links. I'm gonna put up some of the links of what we talked about. There'll be more photos. I'll give you links to this map and this interactive map. The hidden life is best.com. Right on, buddy. Right on, Robert. Thanks for taking some time under your Sunday to talk bacon with us. I might have bacon for dinner. <laughs> hey, love you guys. Okay, thanks take care. Up. Yeah, thanks, buddy. Take Stay care. Stay strong. Uh, we Peace. will. You too. All okay. Right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. And that was a chat with Robert Frederick. What do you think, buddy? Oh, yeah, man. Like he said, it was just scratching the surface of it. Yeah, you got like a little it. triggered on the Wheel of Time thing, but that's all right. Great. I get no, it's it fresh good. for you. It's I can't fresh. wait to see it. You're just going off. It's funny because you were just going off about it like yesterday in the yeah. truck. Yeah. Unsolicited, too. You. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it's just because it's really bad. Did it's it just not... come out then? It's, uh, it's uh, episode six right now. What episode are you on? Six. I've been keeping Can't be up. that bad. <laughs> well, no, no. I mean, I have. I mean, I'm gonna watch the first season, but they're ju- they are really like just destroying it. They really are adding a whole bunch of crap in for no reason at all. Yeah. It's really weird. They're just taking. I don't care about the multi culty aspect of it, like whatever that. But when you're changing the story for no reason at all, and you're messing up the story, and it's not the the, the writing's not good either. They're, there's all kinds of problems and mistakes with what they're changing, right? It's like, why, why, do you, why are you changing the story? Keep it as much as you can with the story, you'd think. But they want, the guy admitted, the guy admitted that in spite, he's going to make some of the characters gay to spite, to piss off some people. I can just make them gay. So the, the ladies, like this, this whole female power structure that's there, right? They're just lesbians now. And just they weren't before? No, not really. Like, they or were, before it was just unmentioned. Yeah, it was kind of mentioned like briefly that they were very close, but they have to start necking and stuff, right? In this. Well, you should be, be, you don't like that kind of stuff? Yeah. Girl on girl? Not these two. You like penetration. <laughs> <laughs> that's not even the point, but that's just a bet. That's just one of this minor, minor changes that have messed up the whole plot. And the yeah. whole Dragon Reborn is, I don't want to do any spoilers here at all. The Dragon Reborn is, a, is supposed to be a yeah, male, to right? Now they're hinting that it could be a multi headed dragon and a female. And like, what are you talking about? Like, that's changing the core, core, core part of the book. Interesting. The female source of the power is taint, the male source of the power is tainted. And this Dragon Reborn comes in and he has to destroy the Dark One, basically, kind of thing. And now they're going to just change the whole, the whole basic thing. I just started watching uh, the next season of Lost in Space came out. So cool. I watched an episode of that. It's probably uh, ruined or something, too, but I don't, I just don't notice. I guess because there was no, I never, I don't know if there's a prequel to it. I guess it's sort of loosely based on the Swiss family Robinson oh, okay. or something. Okay. I don't know. It's yeah. just like, I use TV as just like, you know, junk food. So yeah. it fits that. Yeah. Uh, fits well, that this book. is an interesting one because it was a book I read over the last four decades from the 80s, 90s, 2000s. And then I finished in. Finally finished that book. In yeah. 2015, <laughs> right? 14 bucks. 14 bucks. Yeah. Massive bucks. Like 14 huge bucks. Tomes. Tomes. <laughs> you know what I found in uh, reading this book about the uh, proofs of conspiracy, about the Illuminati and the German Union and all this stuff? What? There's two characters in there, Dr. Spark, Dr. Stark. Tony Stark? And Pot. Marijuana? No, like Pot, P-O-T-T. Like. Oh. I mean, do you think they get names from some of those secret societies and make like Marvel Universe movies out of them and stuff and comics? Maybe. And Stark and Pepper Potts? Yeah, I don't know who Potts is. That's his assistant. Oh, is it? And Gwyneth Paltrow. 
Interesting. Well, yeah, I, I do think that they that they scour all those old stuff just for ideas. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Know, like, Ooh. Yeah, there might not be a like a, there might not be like a magic aspect to yeah, it. Yeah, just yeah. fucking just, straight up plagiarism. Yeah. Well, not even plagiarism. You're just get, get, getting names for characters, but there must be a power to it. Like, I mean, I do that in Dungeons and Dragons too. So I look at historical like three, three. I shouldn't say this. It's time this to wrap this, this up. This is going to be get a, into D and D. This is going to be protocols. A, that's no, gone too a, far. Yeah, I don't want to say it because it'll ruin it'll the surprise. Give it for up guys, for you for yeah. the guys tonight, yeah. in case they're listening to this live stream. You don't want to fumble up your your D and D. No, uh, no, not for tonight. Oh. For the oh, you're planned out a few plot. weeks in yeah, advance. Oh, yeah, months. Oh. Yeah, months. It's a big thing. Yeah, months. He's planned out months in advance. But on the podcast, hey, I didn't have time to do <laughs> <laughs> It's not all planned. Like, it's not all written out or anything. It's just in my head. <laughs> Speaking of tomes, head over to adultbrain.ca if you want to check out some of the tombs we've turned into audio. Adultbrain.ca. Get all our audio books that Graham's narrated for you over there. Proofs of Conspiracy be coming out this month. ISIS Unveiled, Volume 2. Bunch of other great titles over there. Contact at thecabin.com if you want to check out one of our events our theme-based tours or workshops, whatever they are, they're a blast. Whatever they are, we have a blast doing them. And um, Arizona's now sold out. Utah's sold out. We still got the two Randall Carlson events. There's room in both of those next year. And then we're at the first event launched of 2023 is the uh, Oahu, Hawaii, stargazing on the beach, surfing with Dave Matheson, cold training, volcanoes. I think there's a mountain in there somewhere. It looks great. It's going to be a blast. Contact at thecabin.com. And, of course, uh, we can't do this show if you guys don't support. Grimerica.ca slash support. If you guys could sign up for a monthly or make a one-time donation or maybe head over to Grimerica Outlaw and sign up for Plus over there. Uh, whatever couple of bucks you can throw into the system to keep the gears lubed up and keep everything going. Uh, once again, it's not a free show. It's a value-for-value value show. So if you add some value to your day, to your life, to your commute, Consider throwing some value back our way, gramerica.ca slash support. I think that's about it. We love you guys. Thanks for listening, and we will see you next week. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in to the live yeah, show. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. See ya. See ya, mother.